live on stage. The sound. Up Orlando. So, is they ready? Yes. The sound. Up Orlando. You know. No! What is going on, party people? It is time for the so show. Yo, what is going on, Orlando? What is going on, all of my people, man? Welcome to the so show. If this is your first time, man. You are in for a treat. This is part of the hip hop culture. Uh, everything about hip hop, man, we're all about it, man. Shout out to all my peoples representing the old zone. And when I'm talking about the old zone, I'm talking about, about all my old school cats that used to go to Skate World or used to go to Oak Ridge Skate Center or used to go to Universal Skating Rink. You know what I'm saying? I used to go to Scats. Or that Park Avenue, man. You know what I'm saying? This is to, tonight is about that, man. Tonight is about that Mr. B's, that Club 436. You know what I'm saying? That touch of class. Tonight is about that night, bro. And I'm so excited, man. Uh, it couldn't have started out better, man. We don't got that orange the hell up out of Dodge, man. And we're starting a brand new season on. The show called America, so that's good too, man. So shout out to you, man. And we we couldn't even have capped it off any better without my next guest coming on the show. Before I introduce my next guest, I want to give a big shout out to all the sponsors that we have for the show. Shout out to you guys, man. Um, our first sponsor that is sponsor. If you need some masks that are designed in a way that individ individualizes you, man, Reach out to my man, Tom'sSons.com, man. Over five generations of fashion, dealing with some of the best designers on the planet, straight out of New York, Manhattan. Go hit that man up, and um, I'm telling you, you will not be let down. Those masks are completely off the chain. And my man, Jesse Jazz, if you need printing, please go to that website, man. Any kind of business designs, any kind of anything printing graphic design work logo work man go hit that brother up jesse jazz five star graphics now we about to get into it with one of the pioneers the legendary pioneers i mean to me he is what was one of the big big influences of pioneers of atlanta and then he got with my man Luke Skywalker Records, and it was just incredible um, rocket la launch from there, man. I mean, this guy has done it all. He represents my childhood, me growing up and listening. That was one of the first music I got to listen to, man, and he had that thing knocking, man. Gotta be tough. Come on, man. Sanford and Son, look. Look at here, man. I am so honored. To have this man come on tonight, the legendary Bronx and Atlanta legend, my brother from another mother, give it up for MC Shah D. Let's yo, go. Yo. What's up, DJ Ron? What's good, man? Chilling, brother. How you doing? Man, welcome to Orlando, brother. Welcome to the Sound of Orlando show, bro. It's an honor and privilege to have you on tonight, man. For reals. No um, doubt, man. No doubt. You've done some legendary stuff, man. I mean, you you were you were in a in a zone and in a lane all by yourself. Um, nobody sounded like you. You were you were just doing your thing. Um, and you made such an impact in the South. I mean, one of the one of the few people that were that were just you know, opening the doors for the people like the 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 Goody Mobs, the 95 Souths, you know, the later come on down the road. You opened a lot of doors that would otherwise have been shut had it not been for people like yourself starting out, giving our, giving our region an identity, you know, and I think that is completely awesome. But you didn't start in the South, which is another awesome thing. I mean, talk... <laughs> Talk about where where you're from, 
originally and how you made your way and got into hip hop and got down south with what you was doing, my brother. Well, basically, you know what I'm saying? I'm from the Bronx, New York City, right? Do I need to cut my mic down or anything? No, you good, Pop. You good. good. Let's go. Yeah, I'm from the Bronx, New York City. You know what I'm saying? So at a tender young age of 11, you know, my mom and dad, they packed me, my brother and sister up and took us to Atlanta. You know what I'm saying? So when I right. got here to Atlanta, you know, I bought I bought the break dancing. I introduced them to the break dancing, you know, the rapping and everything. So basically how I really got into the game, man, I was just I just used to always, you know, uh, in a talent shows and everything like that. You know what I'm saying? So. I don't know what that is ringing. I'm looking at it. It's showing me text messages. But yo, like I yeah, said, yeah, I used, you good, Poppy. Go, let's go. I, yeah, I used to be in talent shows and everything, man. So back in the days when the Roxanne Roxanne craze was going on, you know, they had the parents of Roxanne's. They had Roxanne Shantae, the real Roxanne, the mom, the dad, whoever, right? So a group came to Atlanta to do a show called The Parents of Roxanne, which was Gigolo Tony and Lacey Lace. So basically, um, I was the opening act for them. And um, when I got off stage doing my thing, they manager stepped to me. Her name was Vanish Lopez. And she was like, yo, you was good up there. What's the name of your song? And I was like, yo, I ain't got no record. I'm local. You know what I'm saying? I'm just trying to really get a deal. So she was like, hey, the, the label that I work for, let me go back, talk to uh, the president, which his name was Billy Hines, which is MCADE dad. She said, let me talk to him, see, can I get you? A deal and I'll get back with you. So yo, she called me back in the week and was like, yo, he said we can make this happen. You know what I'm saying? So they put me and DJ Man on the Greyhound bus. You know what I'm saying? Shout so out to DJ Man. Let's go. Let's go. Up. So me and DJ Man, we jumped on the Greyhound bus, you know what I'm saying? And we went down to Fort Lauderdale, and that's when we recorded to join a rap would never die, my first song I ever made. Wow, man. And and, and talk about what Atlanta was like, like during that time, um, because for a lot of people, they they think and know Atlanta is like it was today, and oh, no. they, don't, they they don't realize that Atlanta was a very young city when you came out. And talk about just the the, the environment out in Atlanta. Yeah, what definitely, you man. Know. You know. When, when uh you know I first got to Atlanta, man, it was real country. You know what I'm saying? They had dirt roads. You know what I'm saying? And everybody, you know, was real, real friendly, man. I'm talking about, man. You, you see people waving from down the block to you. You know what I'm saying, man? Everybody was real. What was that Southern? What's that? What they call it? Southern uh, Southern, Southern hospitality. hospitality bro. Yeah, yeah, the Southern yeah. hospitality, man. I mean, it was incredible back when I first came to Atlanta, you know what I'm saying? It was a right. beautiful thing, man. Like I said, the people was real country and nice. You know, you can leave your bicycle outside, your motorcycle, mini bike, whatever, man. But you know, the the, the new Atlanta now, I mean, this is like the new New York now, you know what I'm saying? Right, right. Talk about, what, what part of Atlanta are we talking about too? Uh, Decatur, I live in Decatur, you know what I'm saying? That's 20 minutes from downtown Atlanta. You know okay. what I'm Shout saying? out to Decatur. Shout out to Decatur. Yes. Um, so now, okay, you're talking about you go down to Broward County, Fort Lauderdale. Uh, what was that like going down there to record your first record? Oh, it was a beautiful thing. Cause like I say, you know, when we live when we lived in New York, that's all we used to talk about is going to Florida, to, you know, the Disneyland and stuff like that. So you know what I'm saying. So when right. I finally got to Florida, man, it was beautiful out here, man. I mean, out there, you know what I'm saying. I mean, and man, I just love the woman that was out there. You know what I'm saying. <laughs> Talk about it. I mean, Talk man, about it. they had the finest woman I ever seen in my life, man. I'm telling you, yo, and I've been a lot of places, you know. Before, you know, I got into the rap thing. My mom and dad, you know, used to take us on vacation everywhere. But, yo, when I got down to, you know, Florida, man, I was really loving the woman down there. Right, right. So you're recording, you're recording your first uh, record in, in Fort Lauderdale. And shout out to Broward County. Shout out to that whole movement in Fort Lauderdale. Been there forever and is still doing it. Um, wh who did you record with? And, you know, do you remember the studio? Um, no, nah, I can't really remember the studio, but uh, I was on Foresight Records, 
Shout and, out to uh, Foresight Records, MCAD. Yeah, yeah. And uh they had a they had a record company in a this this place called Lotter Hill Mall. They had a record store, I meant to say, and then in the back, the back of the store was the office in the record company. Wow, wow. And so you record this record and you put it out in the streets. Um, how did the buzz start happening? Well, basically, man, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I knew I knew it was going to be a hit, you know, not trying to, you know, be confident. But the thing is, I was just really biting off New York because, you know, Dougie Fresh had a special gadget. So I was like, yo, man, I got to get me one of these cartoons, too. So, you know what I'm saying? I came with the Pink Panther, you know what I'm saying? So Pink Panther, let's go! <laughs> word up. So I was like, yo, I know I can't go wrong using this because Dougie Fresh record, the show was a hit. So I was like, yo, I'm going to represent, you know, with the Pink Panther for down here. You know what I'm saying? Right, right, right. Man, and that and that record, that, that record, that whole thing knocked, man. It had that hump in it, man, and it just, it, it created this, like I said, it had its own vibration to it because New York was dominant at the time. Word. And it was it was artists like your Gigolo Tony. Shout out to him. He's going to be on in March, you know, and artists like Gucci Crew and people like that that were giving us the identity, you know, and, and, and keeping us feeling like we had something to say because we did. You know, Florida, Florida was like, you know, we weren't playing back in them days. You know, shout out to Magic Mike and all of them. You know, um, so you get that going. Um, and a lot of my peoples, shout out to my man Rick. Um, he his one of his earlier memories is seeing you at Electric Avenue opening up for two live crew back in the days. And okay, you know, and my man Clay um Clay Dudley right here, he said. Man, I first seen you at Skate World. Now, all of this is in Orlando. Um, did you start, was it your idea to do a tour of Florida? Or was that kind of, uh, or, or was that the record company's idea? Well, basically, you know, I guess, you know, the record since I was, you know, coming out of Florida, a Florida label, you know what I'm saying? So I guess... Uh, foresight service, you know, the Florida, you know, the state of Florida first with the song. So like I say, um, I start getting my first calls from Florida, the state of Florida and stuff. Right. Okay. All right. So um, who was the producer? Who produced the joint? Believe it or not, man, I hate to say it. They gave the producing credit to a brother by the name of Frank Cornelius because he played the keyboard. But actually putting the whole song together, man, I had this song at the house, so I didn't know how to work a drum machine or play any instruments. So basically how we put the song together, I beat on the table, and he programmed the beat into the 808 drum machine. And then once we got through laying the beat down, then I told him how I wanted the Pink Panther to go because I had it. I wanted to go a certain, wanted it to go a certain way. You know what I'm saying? So right. I told him. So basically, I produced the song, but they gave the credit to him. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. You know, right, right. Oh, I, um, real quick, um, because I know we're gonna we kind of jump back to the past, but how did you get with DJ Man? Well, DJ Man, believe it or not, I was a DJ, you know, and a rapper. So basically, when I used to do house parties, DJ Man used to show up and he was like, yo, man, I know how to DJ, but I don't know how to DJ that good. So I told him, I said, yo, come over to my house, you know what I'm saying? And I'll teach you, I'll teach you how to get down. And believe it or not, I taught him how to get better as a DJ. And I mean, he surpassed me a hundred million times. I mean, the brother took off after that. Wow. Wow. I mean, and his cuts. His cuts were so clean, man. Like, That's right. and, and that was another thing that set us apart from New York because at that time, and um, I had Mr. Mix on uh, a week and a half ago, and we were talking about how when it, when it came to the South, when nobody jacket with our tempos, like our, yeah. when you talk about DJing and scratching, like you had to be on it to hit them tempos. And right. you guys were some of the first people that, you know, we heard when we was listening to Man, bro. Man was just just completely incredible, man. So shout out to him, man. Right uh, 
So that record, that record did pretty damn good. I remember it playing nonstop at every spot that I went. Like okay. you couldn't, you couldn't go in a car and I'm not playing it. Like you couldn't go to to a skating rink and not hear it or a club and hear it. Um, how was that? How was that tour for you? Like touring Florida and what's some of the craziest stuff that you see with that when that record was was hot. I mean, touring Florida, like I say, was a beautiful thing, man, because like I say, it seemed for some reason down in Florida, you got more women than guys out there. So, I mean, it was a beautiful thing going from, you know, club to club, city to city. You know what I'm saying? And I mean, you know, it was just, it was just great, man. Me and the woman, man, we had a lot of fun. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Where were you getting those, uh, those custom suits at? It, it, it felt like, I mean, you was rocking some, for the time, I mean, it was just some dope custom, like, hip-hop gear, the hats, the the jackets, the, the pants. What, where were you getting all that stuff from? Well, basically, you know, I, what I did was I used to uh, fly up to New York and get all my stuff because I know New York had the fly gear, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah, I used to just basically go up to New York because I was like, Yo, I know if I get this from up here and I rock it down there, I ain't gonna see too many people with it. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. Yeah. Incredible, man. And then um, yeah, you definitely one of the few people down here rocking them dookie ropes first. Um <laughs> and we, we we definitely remember seeing that. Now talk about talk about the moment that Luke Skywalker records and Mr. Mix start getting involved in the construction of what MC, like that to me, that was the explosiveness. Once that happened, you know, it was like, and then you made the announcement right when the record started, I bought a Luke Skywalker record. And you know, and like that just set <laughs> kind of like this whole like movement off. Talk about, talk about from the beginning, how did that come about? And then how did you guys, cement it by actually all right let's do this and put a record out together all right well basically it started like this you know what i'm saying i did a show somewhere in florida with the two live crew so you know uh my man fresh kid ice all right peter him you know fresh kid yeah. ice he stepped to me he was like yo shot d what up man you know uh luke like your music you know what i'm saying so he was like yo luke wants you to join the label you know what i'm saying so i told him i said yo tell luke I got about four more months on this contract with Foresight. And when I get through, I get in touch with them. You know what I'm saying? I reach out and we can make something happen. So basically when my contract ran out, you know what I'm saying? I called Luke. I was like, yo, I'm a free agent now. You know what I'm saying? So he was like, uh, you got any ideas for, uh, you know, songs? I said, yeah, I got a million ideas. You know what I'm saying? So I told him, I said, yo, I don't know how to work a keyboard. Or, you know what I'm saying, work a drum machine. He's like, don't worry about that. You know, my man, um, Mitch, Mr. Mitch, not to work the drum machine. So basically, he flew me and Cool Kali down there. Believe it or not, he, my man, Cool Kali, was my manager. At that time, DJ Man was going through a little little thing, you know, with the substance abuse thing. So he was nowhere to be found. You know what I'm saying? Right. So Kali was panicking, like, yo, man, what we going to do without man? I said, man, you know, don't worry. Come on, Kali, man. You know, I know how to DJ. So I brought my turntables and my records down there. And like I said, we got to the studio, and I beat on the table, told Mr. Mitch what kind of beat I wanted. You know what I'm saying? So I beat on the table. So he put the beat in the drum machine. And basically, believe it or not, I did the scratches on Gotta Be Tough. I used the old Earth, Wind & Fire record called Brazilian Rhyme. And I used the record by the Treacherous Three called Action. When you, you know, right? When, yeah, that was a song called Action by the Tre Treacherous Three I used. And basically, man, you know, I just put it together, man, and it came out beautiful. That's crazy, man. So you hear me at the top of the show. I'm like, ba -da -ba 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 -ba. like yep. that's you. And shout out to Mr. Mix because Mr. Mix said the very same thing and it blew my mind. Because for the whole time I'm thinking, man did all of that. And then he's like, nah, man, you wouldn't believe it, man. Sadie did that. I'm like, 
What? Yeah, Get yeah. out of here, man. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. And yeah. so you you did the cut, and Mr. Mix, you know, provided your inspiration, did the beats. Yeah, he um, like I say, I beat on the table. He was the 808 king, man. And I said, Yo, I want my beat to go like this, and he put it right in the drum machine for me. You know what I'm saying? And he had that 808, man. Uh like uh he's one of the he's probably one of the most underrated producers, but he had that 808 machine knocking with no some of the clearest, you know, drops that I mean it not too many people outside of maybe Magic Mike have has got those drops that that are so clean, but will blow your damn amps, boy. If you got the face turned on too loud, <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. And yo, so, you, okay, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Now nah, I was gonna say you wouldn't even believe it, man. Mr. Mitch was the producer for every artist on Luke Records, Luke Skywalker Records, except me back then. That's insane because he told me that very thing. And I, as he's telling me, I just couldn't believe it. I'm like, LaJuan Love? Yep. And <laughs> that LaJuan Love joint was hard. That's right. Hard. And it's crazy because you were sort of label mates with, you know, two live crew um, and Quet, LaJuan Love, and even Professor Griff. Yeah, Griff it's came. Like, he came after I left. Right, like right after you left. But yeah, man, I mean that's that's a pretty diverse kind of situation, man. On 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 many levels. And then you wouldn't believe it. Um, I had a partner I used to rap with in high school, and he was in the service. So when he got out the service, he called me up. He was like, "Yo, Sha, I see you doing your thing. What's up?" So I told Luke, "Yo, man, I got a partner I used to rap with in high school. Man, can I get him a deal?" And Luke was like, ain't no problem, you know, and guess who that artist was? Who? Tony MF Rock. What? Yeah, what? that's my I got him a deal with Luke, man. I got him, I got him hooked up, but he wasn't on Luke Records. They put him on Effect Records, Luke. Other label right. he had, Effect Records. Right. Uh, for those that don't know, Luke did have a sister label called Effect Records. Yes. I mean, yep. bro, that's... That's some uh, Florida history for your ass right now, man. Um, so what did you feel the impact of that album did for your career in the sense of you starting out kind of underground, but Luke was like Florida's first major label, if you will. Like, yeah, basically, man, you know, Foresight Records, you know, I take my hat off to them, salute to them for, like I say, yeah. just getting me in the game, but when I got with Luke, he took me to that other level where I needed to be, you know what I'm saying? Um, and how far was the reach? Like, how far, were, were they playing you in Kansas City, California? Were you all over the nation at that moment when that record dropped? Well, the, the, dis the distribution was there, but the acceptance wasn't there. What I mean by that was, the record was in your town, but if you was like up north, like in New York and East Coast, y'all wasn't check. They wasn't checking for that kind of rap. Even though I was from New York, they wasn't checking for the up tempo beat back then. Wow, wow. But out in the West Coast, they loved me from you know, from uh, the Midwest to the West Coast, and you know we had the South on lock. You know what I'm saying? Right. Um, do you think? Um, do you think at the time when when that tempo was out? Um, they didn't understand the music because they didn't see what that music was doing in the club uh, versus kind of like what, because like in New York, it's like you got to be accepted by the block, you know, your, your neighborhood. But down south, it was like, nah, that's got a bump in the club. Everything's that's like right. that now. But back then, they didn't realize that, you know, you go to a club and that's rocking, and the ladies are wearing barely nothing. You know, do you think right. that kind of that kind of jacked with uh, a lot of the trajectory of what you what what Miami bass or you know just that southern sound did for artists? You know, do you think that that kind of like um, 
what's the word I'm looking for? Um, that segregation when it comes to that. Do you think do you think it was misplaced or you, do you think it actually worked worked for the better for the better yeah. man? Well, it definitely worked for the better because I mean, you know, New York was so they were so intelligent with their raps and you know, you know not trying to really talk about down south but the level of education, the education level was like 10 years behind compared to New York, you know what I'm saying? Right. So that's why, like I said, when you had groups coming like the Two Live Crew, you know, talking to the girls and stuff, that's what we was used to down here. You know what I'm saying? Like I say, um, Egyptian Lover, you know, uh, Pretty Tony. See, all them records was, like I say, hot down here with us. But, you know, don't get me wrong. You throw on like a couple of New York records, they was okay. But for the most part, they really wasn't checking for New York just like New York wasn't checking for us. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. Talk yeah. about how how it was in your hometown of Atlanta um, and how were they feeling you out there doing that, that particular moment in history? Oh, it was a beautiful thing. You know what I'm saying? But one thing about Atlanta, they really wouldn't bring me in, embrace me, 100 percent because they knew i was from new york you know what i'm saying they knew the accent you know what i'm saying so really they used to call me to run dmc down you know of atl you know down south they used to call me to run dmc down south you know what i'm saying so you know like i said i really i got more love from florida than i did from atlanta and then you know when your hometown ain't gonna really show you no love anyway you know what i'm saying but like i said i really couldn't get the love because i wasn't from atlanta right right um talk about um talk about if you can why from a successful place um considering you know luke was still virtually a, a young company um you know and you were kind of like at your apex if you will like you were just continuing to climb why at that moment or later on a little bit that you guys went your separate ways can you talk about that oh yeah definitely i mean it was a money thing you know what i'm saying i mean luke was being greedy keeping all the money and shit you know right. so i was like yo man i can't i can't keep putting out these great albums you know and i know they selling and you coming to me talking about only sold 25 30 30 000 copies come on son you know what i'm saying so right it wasn't nothing but i mean it wasn't nothing personal like i say it was just a business you know his business wasn't right he was keeping all the money so i had to get out of there right right and that and that was it felt like you had just literally pulled up and you were bouncing and um a lot of people you know especially you know a lot of young artists you know and a lot of you know the older artists you know either had to find that out the hard way or didn't know that that kind of stuff existed because they always see the money up front. Well, we're going to give you to do what we want you to do, but they don't see the long term. Talk about, um, if you can, what that's like, um, what you feel, if you could tell some of the youths them uh, about the importance of knowing your business and, 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 and being active when it comes to the business side of records, making records. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, it's it's eighty percent business, ten percent pleasure, whatever you want to call it. You know what I'm saying? You got to really be up on your business, cause like I say, even when I got with Foresight, they stole. Like I say, they stole the producing credit, so that mean I couldn't get no publishing. You know what I'm saying? Then when I got with Luke, you know, Luke stole the publishing. He kept on my publishing. You know what I'm saying? That's because I was young and naive and I didn't know about that part of the business. You know what I'm saying? Right. So, you know, when you get in this business right here, man, if what, what you don't know, they not going to tell you. So you definitely need to, you know, hit a couple of books or, you know what I'm saying? Take a couple of classes, you know what I'm saying? To find out what's going on with the business part of it. Cause like I say, 80% is is the business of it you know what i'm saying did you have do you did you have representation you know as far as like a lawyer you know and um you know it was kind of like a gentleman's handshake if you will with the contract no don't worry i got you 
and sign the contract. Out. Believe it or not, when I made Gotta Be Tough, I didn't even have a contract. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I was just going to get down with Luke because I was trying to continue my career. You know what I'm saying? Right. So we didn't even do no paperwork. Like I said, I don't even think I got paperwork until the second album. I don't even think the Gotta Be Tough album I had paperwork. You know what I'm saying? I think right. I got the paper Luke when, when Cause I got crazy on him after the Gotta Be Tough album when he sent me a check. I started raising hell about the money. So that's when, when we came to come and correct an '88 album. That's when the contracts came. Right. Um, and then, what did you feel um, the contracts to you represented in the sense of, like you said, you already felt slighted. What are those contracts? kind of make you feel once they came into play yeah once they came into play you know what i'm saying i really still go get no lawyer to look at them you know what i'm saying i mean i'm at the crib me mom and dad you know we trying to read the lawyers knowing we don't know nothing about the business you know what i'm saying right. so when the contracts came in play i really got jerked you know what i'm saying because I mean, he had me for like a couple of years, you know what I'm saying? He had me for a couple of extra years that I know I really didn't want to be there. But then, like I say, I finally went and got a lawyer after the second album, and he just luckily got me out of the contract and sued Luke. Wow. 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 Now, talk about that and what – because um, if we look towards the future um, – especially when um, these people, when I'm talking about these people, the power, the government, they came in, in a sweep and started getting a lot of these artists for sampling and started really taxing them, taking away a lot of their um, royalties and publishing. Um, do you feel like you missed that whole thing by not? Like it's almost a blessing that you didn't get sued for any of the the stuff that was sampled because back like you said back then were no machines you you couldn't even mask it too much you you took the whole damn sample yeah definitely so I missed it like you said just by an inch I think after the coming correct in eighty eight album Biz Markey put out that album. Uh, with uh, just a friend on it, I think. Right. And that's that's when they came. That's when, like you said, the government came after the sampling thing. So, like you said, I barely missed it, man. So I was lucky. Right. And 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 back in those days, um, a lot of Luke Skywalker stuff was primarily just samples. That's you know? nice. And he faced a lot of litigation because of that. Because a lot of not only the stuff that they were doing but a lot of the artists that he had were doing the same thing um i i wouldn't call it uh wouldn't call it karma but to your point um you know if you're going to do business um you know the record industry is, isn't it is a cold place you know and a lot of times uh they take they they, that's why they want young people, because young people normally don't care about money, you know, in that regard. They care about things, objects, right? So if yeah, I get definitely. you a gold chain, or I get you a platinum record, or, yeah. you know, stuff that you could show people, you know. But this generation, they do care about money. Oh, yeah, yeah. man. I mean, these young boys are up on their business, man. I mean, and then, you know. This this generation here, man, I mean, you know, I mean, they getting the liquor deals, you know, they, they getting shoe deals. I mean, when we was doing our thing, we wasn't really getting it like that, you know? Right, right. Um, Explore that for a minute, man, because I think that's really important when we're talking about the history of hip hop and the history of music in general. Um, talk about that, how uh, being an artist, you're performing, you're doing a lot of these, you know, pop ups. They call, you know, it was they called it different back in the days. You know, uh, we go to the record store and sit there and sign up records. Now you just pop up kind of anywhere and market your stuff. But you do it. That's all hard work. Doing yeah. shows, it's hard work. You know, going from club to club, having to see all these people, it's hard work. 
Talk about all the work that you put in, but yet you don't see the equal side of the money. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You know, the record company, you know, they send you out on a promotional tour. You know, you you going, you doing 30, 20 cities. You know what I'm saying? But they reaping all the benefits. You know what I'm saying? Right. And it's, it's just, you know, it shouldn't be like that. You know what I'm saying? And I heard, I mean, it's it's even worse now because I heard they got something called a D60 deal where the record company now, they get they get part of your merchandise and they get part of your show money. Right. And back in the days, uh, for a lot of artists, that was their only way of kind of justifying even doing the record deal because they at least had shows. But you damn near had to kill yourself and no no sleep, you know, uh, always on the road, you know, and every dollar, you know, it costs money to tour too. So it's not like that's a, you know, you get the money and you can save most of it. You got to pay people that are on tour with you. And so there's a lot of, a lot of stuff that artists don't really realize that um, to your point, make it difficult to even acquire any wealth, all of the stuff looks like wealth, but it isn't. Oh know? yeah, definitely, man. You know what I'm saying? But I just, I just, like I say, I just depended on my, like you say, my little show money because my mind had got so set with Luke, with him being a crook that I might as well get all the show money I can because I'm not going to get a royalty check. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> um, so you leave Luke, you leave the legendary Luke Skywalker records. What's going through your head at that time? And what's your next move? What what does MC Shy D decide to do once he walks away from this particular situation? Well, I knew, I mean, I was, believe it or not, I was losing interest in the music business. You know what I'm saying? Because, I mean, you know, I even got jerked by Foresight for the little two 12 inches I did. So I was like, yo, man, I'm ready to get in these streets. You know what I'm saying? I'm ready to get in these streets and, you know, get that work and put it to work. You know what I'm saying? Because right. I was getting so discouraged with the music business. But I, I called myself going to start my own label. I, I started, I crunk up my label. It was called Ben's Records. And my homeboy, Michael Sterling, got me a distribution deal with uh, Joey Boy Records, On Top Records. And that's when I came with the Don't Sweat Me album. Wow. 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 Talk about it, people. Talk about it. And this is still in Florida, or you go back to Atlanta? Well, I went, I went back to Atlanta, you know what I'm saying? Because I felt like I had no more business down here in florida you know what i'm saying so right. basically when i did the business with joey boy i took care of the business but I, I went back to the crib right and what was atlanta like at that at that time um you know now that you've been out and like you were saying um there was a little more backing behind you um was it any different or was it still similar to where you started from well, I fell I fell down the hill a little bit, you know, because Joey Boy, they wasn't as good as Luke. You know what I'm saying? I mean, no disrespect to them, but they was a, a Cuban company, and Luke was a black owned company. So Luke was Luke had more, you know, more power to the street with the you know the people than Joey Boy did because they wasn't really getting out there like that. Right. You know what I'm saying? And their promotion was crap compared to luke's you know what i'm saying i mean they wouldn't even really promote my album you know what i'm saying they didn't promote my album they let me do a video but you know that's about it talk about um i mean and and shout out to everyone that remembers this song uh shake it and i remember that song being so damn big and huge you couldn't go anywhere and not hear that song. And it played for years, like nonstop. Oh, yeah, talk definitely. About, talk about that record. And did you see that record doing what it did? No, nah, believe it or not. Like I tell everybody, man, I didn't even want to make a shaker type record. DJ Toomp came up with the idea, and then it had me frustrated because I knew 
that was two live crew style. So basically, one day we sitting in the hotel room and Tunk comes up, yo, man, we need to do a record like two live crew talking about girls. I was like, yo, man, that ain't my style. You know what I'm saying? That's they style. I don't want to bite they style. They got they style. We got our style. He was like, right. yo, man, but look look how big two live crew is over us. And it made so much sense to me that I said, cool, I'm going to give it a try. So Mike Fresh, you know, he he already had to beat the shake it because that was a beat we was going to give to some girls we was trying to produce. You know what I'm saying? So oh, Mike wow. Fresh already had cooked up the beat for shake it man so basically man i sat there for about 45 minutes and i wrote the song and then i called luke and them and asked could we go in the studio and they let us go to the studio and that's how shake it came about wow insane insane i mean because that record man was like i said during that time it was just non-stop it was almost like at the equivalent of push it it was just yep. everywhere it played everywhere anywhere there was some sort of dancing some sort of shaking going on that record was there all times growing up in the south and let me tell you i think how pushy came about we did a lot of shows with salt pepper and they didn't have them type of records man but when they start doing like i said we did a lot of tours and everything with salt and pepper and then all of a sudden i hear the pushy song i said yo they don't made a down south record you know, <laughs> talk, you know what I mean? talk about it yeah, man. So i was like yo they they smart I, it was herbie love bug or it might have been a whole group they probably said yo we need to make one of these records man because they rocking like when we on tour man and shot D and them go out there man they got the crowd rocking to that 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 uh fast joint you know what i'm saying right, right, so right. i swear i think them watching us me and two live they said yo we got to make one of these joints wow yeah shout out to salt and pepper man because that's the record that will never die too that's right uh that record still knocks to this day and to your point uh my man shout out to mc boo uh with uh the royal posse and dj magic mike he had said uh the they filmed the video, which I remember as a kid hearing about it, but I didn't put two and two together. And they filmed, according to him, they filmed that video um, at in Orlando at the Central Florida Fairgrounds performing with a lot of, to your point, a lot of the bass artists that were out at the time. And who knows, you might have been at that show. Um, it was at it was Fairgrounds, and, and, and then I seen the video, and I'm like, that does look like the fairgrounds. I'm like, get out of here, man. Okay. But yeah, that that makes a lot of sense, you know, uh, because it did have that kind of two live crew knock to it. Yeah, man. And I know, like I say, we did a lot of shows with Salt and Pepper on tour. We was on tour together. So I think, you know, they was like, yo, we got to make, because we, we doing a lot of shows in the South, so we need to make one of these joints, man. And that was a very good idea, man, because that was like, to me, the biggest song they ever made. Right. It was, man. It, it it was. I mean, I don't think even Let's Talk About Sex beat that record or what nah. a man. Push It still That's rocks right. to this day. I mean, as soon as that beat come on, you're like, oh, yeah. You know? I yeah. mean, but now so you released this album um released this album with uh this record label yeah joey and, boy with joey boy and it wasn't what you were thinking it was gonna do like as far as uh and that's another lesson or gem uh for people that think record companies are the end all be all because a lot of them will not push your record that's they right. won't even you know, it, they sign artists, and it's as if you never even signed with them. You're like, yeah. we well, we supposed to push this? <laughs> yeah, it's crazy, man. And then, you know, I, I can't, me, myself, I'm going to be honest with myself. I can't blame, blame it 100% on them because what I did, I hurt myself also because when I got away from Luke, I was a little bitter. So I was like, yo, man. I don't even make country. I mean, I ain't even no country boy. I'm about to try to go back to my roots. You know what I'm saying? So right. the Don't Sweat Me song was a straight up East Coast records. So I let my fans down also. You know what I'm saying? And I think 
I think Joey Boy felt like, yo, we can't really promote a song like this because it ain't no up tempo record. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. Right. So I, I think, like I said, I, I, I blame it fifty fifty. I fifty on them and fifty on me for making that wax song. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> wow, uh, man. <laughs> Man, you hear you hear you heard it here first, man. From Shy D, man. I, I mean, how many people do you know that can be that retrospective on themselves and be that honest with themselves? Like, say, hey, yeah, I, I bombed that one, you know. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, and and that's tough, man, because once again, for artists, a lot of people don't realize how much heart and soul they put in the stuff, and if it doesn't work out. It's almost like a marriage. It's almost like getting divorced. Like, you know, you put all your whole being into this, and if it bombs, you feel like you lost everything in the world. Yeah, definitely, man. And like I say, um, you know, one side of me, like I say, was saying, yo, don't make this kind of record because these people ain't ready for that down here. But the other side was saying, hey, you know what I'm saying? I'm going back to my roots. <laughs> Right, right. And you know, you know sometimes you got to bet on you, man, and you got to, you got to, you can live with those results. You know, yeah. a lot of times, you know, when you bet on other people and it does, it still doesn't work out, you feel even worse. So oh, I'm yeah. pretty sure you can feel that, well, at least if I was going to die on that hill, I did it on my own. It, it ain't nobody That's did it. Right. To me. That's right. <laughs> Now, like uh, you said, because if somebody else, now, like you said, because if I was, when I got away from Luke and I went to Joey Boy and I had my mind set on another Shake It Tight record, and then Joey Boy and I'm a Michael Sterling saying, nah, man, let's take it East Coast and it flopped out. Like you say, I would feel even mad and worse. You know what I'm saying? But like I say, this was on me. Um, shout out to Alfredo um, on the check in. He said, don't sweat the tech. I mean, don't sweat me. Is the was the joint? Shout out to my man Rick. He said that was dope. What are you talking about? So, well, I mean, you know, I mean, they them them two guys that you know said that they had to have a lot of East Coast influence in them because "Don't Sweat Me" was a East Coast record. It was nowhere, nowhere down south. You know what I'm saying? Well, let with truth be told, let me tell you something, man. Florida and Atlanta at that time. There was so there was so many. That's why I love Florida. Okay. Because unlike New York, and shout out to all my New Yorkers, but unlike New York, Florida was blessed with everything. Word. So we got the reggae. We got the we got hip hop, um, East Coast hip hop. We got West Coast hip hop. We got down South hip hop. And we were just blessed to kind of have a little bit of everything. And, you know, that means everything at the end of oh, the yeah. day. It means, yeah. it means that we were, you know, to me, we were more mu musically educated than a lot of people uh, because we weren't we weren't stuck on one particular vibration. That's yeah, y'all open-minded. Right. And, the, and that's why the capital of DJs, in my mind, is Florida. Okay. You know, it's Orlando because you go to a club out here. I mean, they know, you know, you can't just be genreified or you only play this one type of music. I mean, you got to play everything. You oh, can't yeah. go to play, not play reggae and not be familiar with reggae or play or play hip hop or, or play this. Like, you got to have a familiarity with all of that. Like, so I love that I grew up here because of that. Now, oh, yeah, no doubt. I'm not taking anything away from New York because hip hop in New York is completely amazing, but that's not the end all be all. Yeah, I got you. That's everything. That's only one type of representation of it. And I think for a lot of times we, we dealt with a lot of that kind of, they look at the South, like we were dumb and didn't know what the hell was going on. But then, like I said, and I'm so I'm giving you your flowers now because you guys were a part of that movement, even though you weren't originally from Atlanta, but you were part of that movement that gave way or gave the courage to others 
to say, you know what? Yeah, I feel that. You know, their prayers, I know her, Shy D. Goody Mob, I know they were listening to Shy D. Oh, yeah, no doubt. Big Gip and Cool Joe, my man. Yeah, I know, yeah. I know, I know Common when he was when he was going to fam you. Okay. He was listening to Shy D. You know, yeah, like, no doubt. You know, so we we did a lot um that we don't realize that we did for a lot of these newer artists for the outcasts for the for the dungeon families for the for the uh you know the the little johns yeah you know all of these people that kind of came down and studied what atlanta was doing shout out to rowdy um rowdy records or you know dallas austin you know a lot of these people you know they took a chance because you remember when monica first came out it was similarly East Coast. Yeah. And then and then she got that Southern sound to it. But yeah, it was all to me, I say it over and over. All of you guys had a major influence on that next wave to come out. Um, and y'all y'all gotta get praise for that, man, because you know, I don't see the outcasts and, and and those people coming to the forefront if it wasn't for folks like you. Even, shit, even Houston. Yeah. You know, you know, they love what Atlanta and the South were doing, Scarface and you know, oh yeah, no doubt. That whole movement. Yeah. You know, it's, it's just a beautiful thing when you're talking about um the many phases that Atlanta kind of went through and to see where it's going now. You're in Atlanta. Talk about talk about the things that you've seen change from the freak Nick days. To where it's at now and was it always strip clubs up there that were clubs or did that or did that change over time talk about that oh no nah, i mean you know the strip club thing you know i really wasn't with it you know what i'm saying i just can't see myself giving them females my money like that you know what i'm saying so i stuck my head in the door maybe twice a year so i really don't know about that scene like that you know what i'm saying but i know when I was doing my thing, it was popping. But then, like, as time went on, you know, people was coming to me saying, yo, man, don't go in there, man. Them girls loving each other. And you know what I'm saying? But I wasn't right. a, a guy never with the strip club thing anyway. You know what I'm saying? But right. I did I did see Atlanta going from what we did with the up-tempo stuff to, like, Goody Mob. They don't dance no more. Because, I mean, Atlanta just did a 360 turn where all of a sudden, all of a sudden, everybody started mean mugging, and you know it wasn't no more southern hospitality. Basically, you know everybody was turning into dogs and killers. You know, uh, what year? What g give people a time period of when that was going on? That was what going on. Was that that came about. I'm gonna tell you exactly when. Like '96, when Master P and them came out. That's when. I see Atlanta just do a 360 degree turn. Wow. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, when that Master P came out, because Master P, you know, was big, man. You know what I'm saying? Right, they right. had a big impact on the world, but they really had a big impact on Atlanta because, I mean, it, it went from happy to sad. Not from happy to mad. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> My man said it went from happy to sad. <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah, that's amazing, man. Um, and do you feel, do you feel, uh, cause you were there during that, that time period of the dungeon family making their, you know, impact and, you know, the rowdy records movement making an impact and 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 LaFace trying to dabble themselves a little more into hip hop and you know uh did you see there being like almost like a musical contradiction because there were they were a part of this movement that was similarly you know the TLCs bringing in kind of like to your point that that happy vibration, that that it's okay to not be a thug. And then um, to your point, that was still going on while Master P and them were, 
was starting to make their 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 uh, moves and you know uh, cash money records and all of that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Did you see kind of like you know the city divide in a way musically, like you know people that only listen to this on this side of town or? Uh, just yeah. explain how the vibration was in that. In the yeah, it definitely because it was like all the people in the hood was sticking to the Master P and the Cash Money music, but all the you know all the fake people, you know what I'm saying that that wanted to be up with the, you know, following the face movement, they wouldn't even come to the hood. They they party in Buckhead, you know what I'm saying? Like Jermaine Dupri and all them, they'll stay up in Buckhead. They wouldn't come to the hood. You know what I'm saying? Right. So it was definitely like the Monica crowd, you know, all of them. See, they stayed on the bougie. I mean, you know, they partied on the bougie side of town, but you still had the hood folks, you know, staying down, staying true to the cash money music and the Master P music. You know what I'm saying? So it was definitely dividing, you know. Right. Talk about uh, DJ Smurf. Okay. Talk about what, what, what you guys, how, how you guys were involved in that kind of movement. All right, well, let me tell you how me getting with Smurf came about. It's funny. Smurf used to, they had a, they got a mixtape king that was out here by the name of King Edward J. I don't know. He was like the jam pony down there where y'all at. Right. And he had the best DJ, so DJ Smurf was like a little 15-year-old kid that used to DJ for Edward J. And I used to always hear him scratching on the records. I said, yo, man, that dude is dope. But right. I didn't know he was that young. So when I finally got a chance to meet him, I was like, yo, this nigga a baby. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. So to make a long story short, I had a concert. I had to go to Canada to do a couple of shows in Canada. And Edward J got a sister by the name of Lady DJ. So I called up. I said, yo, Lady DJ, I got to go to Canada to do about four shows. I need you to be my DJ. So she was like, Shy, I can't do it, man. You know, I can't get in front of all them people, man, and DJ. So she was like, once you uh take Smurf with you. I was like, yo, ain't that a little kid? She was like, yeah. So I was like, yo, she was like, call his mom and get in touch with his mom and dad and ask him, could he go with you? So that's what I did. I reached out to him and talked to his mom and dad. I told him, yo, I got a couple of shows in Canada. This is what I'm going to pay him. We're going to be gone for about a week. And they was with it, so they let him go. You know what I'm saying? So he went with me to Canada, and we rocked the house. So during the course of that time, I had a lot of legal troubles. You know what I'm saying? I was, I, I, I knew I was going to prison. You know, I told Smurf, I said, yo, man, I got to go to prison for a couple of years. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to teach you how to work this drum machine. And when I get out of prison, we're going to pick back up where we left off at. So I taught him how to work the SB-1200. And left the drum machine with him. And then I, you know, I went off, did my time. And when I got out, I came back and me and Smurf hooked back up. And we got a record deal with Itchy Barn Records, which was here in Atlanta. And that's when I made MC Shadi the comeback album. Shout out to Itchy Barn Records. For those that don't know, all my DJs know what that label looks like. Itchy yeah. Barn Records. Wow. And so you you said uh you, you said you were on the SB12. You, yeah, twelve hundred. Wow, right. Like Chris taught me how to work the SB. Taught me and Tune how to work the SB twelve hundred. Wow, wow. And uh, do you still got it? Yeah, I got it sitting right over here. <laughs> yes. Right uh, you. Woo. Let me see. Let me see. I picked the. Nah, I can't pick the thing up. I've been on track. Oh man, nice man. I mean, you know, it, would you ever thought that that machine would become what it is today? Like, you know, you can't even find one for less than seven Gs. Yeah, yeah, it's incredible. Believe it or not, I got another one up in my room where I used to have my studio at. I got two in here. Wow. Yep, I got two. Shout out to all my SB1200 people out there, man. That is completely amazing. Um, right. So you get out, you start doing your thing. You put out another album. Um, what did... Do you feel like you've done everything you can, or you still you still feel that that buzz like you did when you was a kid? Like you yeah. still want to kind of stay into the music aspect of it? Yeah, definitely. I because you know, like when you go to prison, believe it or not, man, it it, it knocks a couple of years off your life because you know you you eating good in there. You know what I'm saying? You ain't out here drinking and smoking. You know what I'm saying? 
So right. I felt like when I got out, I, I was back at my youth. You know, I felt like it was 88 again. You know what I'm saying? Right. So, yeah. So like I say, Smurf, he, he had turned into a beast on the drum machine. And then uh, he made a song for me. My first single with Ichiban was True to the Game. It was an up-tempo joint. And that record did real well for me. So it was like Shadi is back. You know what I'm saying? Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Um, so what, are you, what are you doing now? Um, and where can people get um, any of or, or look for when you're trying to, uh, whatever you got going on right now? Where can people find anything MC Shy D? And how, can, yeah, how can they? Well, uh, I'm on Facebook, you know, but I, I got a. I got an MC Shad page, but that's not my main page. My main page is Thomas Jones, which is my middle name and my last name. And I'm on Instagram under MC Shad D. I'm on Twitter under MC Shad D. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, you know, only thing I got to do is just Google my name. You know what I'm saying? I ain't hard to find. And you know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm here. I heard that, my brother, man. And, and are you, uh, do you own a club right now? I used to own a club, you know what I'm saying? I sold I sold that club because I, I got bored just being in there, you know what I'm saying? So but that was some years ago, you know what I'm saying? But oh, okay. now, yeah, now I, I DJ at a club. Oh, okay, cool. What club is this? It's a club in Decatur called Dudley's. It's a hood spot. Hood spot, man. Shout out to anybody that knows where that spot is. Go support the man. All right, well, before I let you get out of here, I got a couple more questions, man. And this one, this one will be a fun one. Um, I I love asking this question to see, you know, what's inside the head of the people that have done great stuff. So without further ado, let's go to top five dead or alive, Mr. Shy D. MC uh, Shard D, top five dead or alive MCs. Who's oh, your wow. top five MCs? Well, my, uh, I like Nelly Mel. Shout out to Nelly Mel. Let's go. Kumo D. Kumo D. Let's go. LL. Yes, sir. LL. Rock Kim. Man. And Biggie. Shout out to Brooklyn. Yes. Now, because you got SB12 and you got two of them, I have to ask you this too. Top five dead or alive producers. Go. Oh, wow. Wow, wow, wow. Come on, Pete. Come on. Uh, my man, um, my man, um, man, what's his name? Um Easy Mo B. Shout out to Easy Mo B. Let's go. Uh Molly Maul. Molly Maul, man. Um, wow, producers. Uh, I'll say, uh, I even say, uh, uh, Clark Kent, Clark Kent, shout out to Clark Kent, yeah, Two uh, more. DJ Mr. Mix, man, shout out to my man, Mr. Mix. Let's go, DJ Magic Mike, Magic Mike, custom records, shout out to Orlando for that, man, yes, man. Uh, last question of the night. If you could tell any of the young kids or any of the people out there um, one thing, what would that one thing be? Keep God first. Keep God first. Man, you hear that? 2021, people. Keep God first, man. It's been such an honor, brother, to have you on tonight, man. Um, I don't care what nobody says. You represent the hip hop culture. Um, you know, you're part of our hip hop story. Um, there should be more conversations about you um, that are that talk about your your contribution. But since we we on the show, we are gonna do it tonight, my brother. And I appreciate you for what all you've done. Um, I know you represent a lot of childhoods and a lot of a lot of teenage years and. A lot of you know young adults, but dude, those were mo some of the most important years of of our lives, and you were the soundtrack to that. So, I appreciate it. you know, um, keep doing you, man. You know, you're always welcome on the show. 
Um, and um, like I said, from Orlando to ATL, man, we thank you, man. We thank you for what you've done, brother. I appreciate it, DJ Rome. Appreciate the interview. Yes, sir. Give it up one time for my man. Gotta be tough, MC Shadi. Let's go. Give it <laughs> up. Thank you, my brother. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, everyone, for joining the show tonight. You know this is the Sound of Orlando show with your boy Rome live and direct in the house for sure. And this show is sponsored by Tomsons.com. Find some beautiful fashion and some masks that we all got to wear at Tomsons.com. We're also sponsored by Five Star Graphics. Need printing? Check my man Jesse Jazz out. Please believe me. Yes, you know what time it is. It is the So Show with your boy, bro, man. Tomorrow night's going to be jam-packed. I will have on the show tomorrow night my man, DJ Ray Swift, representing Old Town Sound and R&B legend. So millions of records, Avant, on a late night edition of the So Show. So if you don't know, now you know. Tell all them people, man, we doing this. We talking about our city. We love you. Stay tuned, my brothers. We out. Live on stage, the sound. Up, Orlando. So, is they ready? Yes. The sound.